our next session is about human intellect and AI. And our first speaker is Dan Bohush. He is your um, researcher I am a in researcher. MSRAI, yes. sitting next to me, bothering me for many years. Yes. So he's going to be our next speaker. Hey, guys. Yeah, I'm Dan. Um, like a lot of people here, I was also an intern with uh, working with Eric and Tim Pack at the time, all the way back in the summer of 2003. Um, I uh, became a full-time researcher in, uh, in Eric's group in uh, 2007. So I thought it would be befitting to uh, bookend my presentation with that here and start by showing you guys uh, a little bit from my job talk. Um, back in the day in my dissertation, I was working on error handling in dialogue systems and speech recognition problems. Um, so I showed this uh, sample interaction with a dialogue system in that age. Um, the text in blue is what the system is saying, the text in gray is what the person is saying, and the text in brackets is what the recognizer understands. to answer the following question. What city are you leaving from? Chicago. Traveling from Chicago. Where would you like to go? Huntsville. Traveling to Seoul. What day did you need to travel? No, no, um, traveling to Birmingham. Traveling in the afternoon. Okay, what day would you be departing Chicago? Uh, the 10th of August. A flight tomorrow. I have a Korean Airlines flight departing Chicago at 1.40 p.m. Arrives at Seoul at 5 p.m. the next day. Do you want to take that? My destination is Birmingham. Traveling on Saturday, August 12th. <laughs> I have a flight departing Chicago at 1.40 p.m. Arrives at Seoul so at 5.05. We were miserably failing. Somehow I got hired. Um, and over the next 10 years, basically, in joining uh, MSR, my research agenda kind of shifted into this area we call now situated interaction, uh, where the goal is more to enable machines to open up their eyes and reason about their surroundings a bit more and collaborate with people in physically situated open world settings. And Eric had uh, to do quite a lot, and I'll say a bit more with that shift. Um, but over the years, we've basically studying these problems. Uh, we've been studying these problems. We build a lot of artifacts, put them around the building. The prototypical example is this little guy that probably a lot of you guys know, um, a directions giving robot that tries to understand what happens with is deployed in an open world, in a in a in an open space where multiple people come and go, tries to understand you know what people want and direct them uh, to the right place. Um, now, if there's one thing about principles of intelligence and one message that I want to get across uh, in this little presentation is that over these years of work in this space, I think I've come to realize that intelligence is actually often social, collaborative, and actually not immediately visible to the naked eye. We do a lot of things that are very, very, very smart, and we don't realize we do them uh, up until the time we try to make a computer do them, and then we realize, oh my god, this is difficult. Uh, when people come to interact with each other uh, with natural language, uh, we coordinate our actions in a very fast-paced, very fluid, mixed initiative manner. We continuously monitor each other, and we produce on many different channels simultaneously. There's, there's the speech, but there's a lot of nonverbal work that's going on. And we do that to resolve in parallel a number of different problems. Uh, a first problem we have to resolve when we come together to interact is um, establish and maintain an open communication channel. Um, you never think of this, but whenever you're in an interaction to someone, you're doing a lot of work with your body, placing yourself the right way, looking at the person for the right amount, and so on, to signal, yes, I'm still in this interaction. Uh, so there's this process of engagement that, you know, in uh, mobile phones and assistants like Siri, you push a button and you're engaged, but if you have a system that lives in the world and tries to naturally interact with people, you kind of have to do work to solve it, and we'll see an example about that in a second. Uh, once you solve that problem of engagement, you need to coordinate with people how you bounce signals from one to the other. Uh, there's a lot of coordination, for instance, happening on the verbal channel with turn taking. We don't overlap so much, or we overlap in very coordinated ways, actually. And then all the nonverbals are also coordinated with everything going, going on. Only once you have kind of solved those two problems, and they're really challenging, uh, you can start worrying about decoding the meaning behind those signals, uh, understanding the intentions. This is where you get into speech recognition and language understanding. And then at the higher level, you again have to do some more longer term thinking and planning about pursuing mutual goals and how do these goals shift over time and plan your whole interaction. 
Um, so in the work that I've been doing, basically we've been looking at constructing these cognitive competencies. And this is something that has been inspired, um, you know, uh, way back, like, and has been taught by other people like Clark, you know, the work on grounding, all these different levels and papers by Eric and Tim in the late 90s uh, that have laid the groundwork for, 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 you know, for this kind of thinking. Uh, so in my work, I've been a lot driven and inspired by, by those papers. And I've tried to sort of bring into this equation more the, the the social and situational context, adding the who, the what, and the why of the surroundings, and building computational models for processes like engagement, turn-taking, understanding, and planning that are tightly coupled into understanding the scene around. Um, and so, just to give you a, a, a hint of what are the challenges in here, I want to show you one quick video about how challenging it might be to maintain engagement, which is something, again, that you never have to think through in your daily life. You all just know how to do it. Uh, getting a machine to do it is much more challenging. Here's a little example from the directions robot, natural interaction happening in the wild. Hi, do you need help finding something? Where's the restroom? The bathroom is just down that hallway and on your right. By the way, would you mind swiping your badge on the reader below so I know who I've been talking with? Got it? Thanks, Luis. Is there anything else I can help you find? No, thank you. Sorry, say that again? No. I'm sorry. I still didn't get that. Can I help you find something else? No, thank you. Okay then, goodbye. The robot has a hard time letting go. Uh, so um, what is going on here? Well, what's going on here is that we all as humans know when we see this picture that this guy is leading. Uh, but all the robot sees is a square about where the face is, and maybe it knows that his face is a bit oriented that way. Uh, but it doesn't know that his shoulders are pointed that way in this case. It doesn't know that he's waving. It doesn't really in this case, and that's something we should definitely do, put it together with where we are in the dialogue and so on. And so because of that, it launches into this next utterance, that's its next dialogue state, after it gave directions to say, is there anything else I can do for you? But that's pretty long, and it happens as the guy is moving away. Now, what's interesting is that just a second and a half or so later, the robot figures out that this guy is actually leaving. By then, it's too late. He's already kind of heard this and stopped and coming back. And so this creates this complete breakdown in sort of the fluidity and the interaction and what, what should actually happen. And so we take a problem like this, an observation like this in the wild, and we think, how do we fix this? What do we do? Um, and um, what I find really interesting about generally, broadly speaking, this line of work with these robots and, and this situated interaction space is that you'll take a problem and then you'll highlight something that feels pretty core, actually, in more fundamental AI terms. So one construct that this uh, sort of drove us towards is this notion of forecasting and how important a role forecasting plays into our interactions. Um, we are able to project very easily ahead what's going to happen. We can finish each other's sentences. Uh, we have this ability and machines don't, and so can we build that? So the idea here was, well, actually the machine will observe just a second and a half later that this person is going away. Um, can we make it uh, forecast that? Can we learn? And then if we could somehow forecast if a T0, even if we weren't sure exactly yet that they're staying or going, can we leverage a device like hesitations, which humans do all the time? Can I say something like, so, and that buys me a few more seconds, speaking of value of information and information computation, to get more information. And then if a T0 plus alpha, they're going away, I can say, so, well, I guess I'll catch you later then. Or if they're still sticking around, I could still naturally say, so, is there anything else I can help you find, right? And so the notion of forecasting, I think, is fundamental in all these systems where you have to do with timing and coordination. And in a case like this, you can actually grab features that the system has, like the location of the face and attention and everything in the kitchen sink. And because the robot knows, based on some heuristic, that at some point disengagement does happen, you can roll that back in time and construct a label and build a model that automatically trains by observing just the interactions and retrospecting over them without any need for manual labeling to learn to anticipate and learn to predict. And you might not do as well as you plan to. You might not be able to anticipate this by five seconds, but you might still gain some time. And then in conjunction with hesitations, that can give you a more fluid interaction. So I just want to show you this as an example of the kind of uh, work we've been doing. 
Um, there's a lot of challenges, like I said, in this space that I think are fundamental AI challenges, challenges with timing, coordination, and initiative, and this was an illustrative example of that. There's interesting challenges in multimodal perception. There's a lot of work these days with deep learning into getting perception to be better and better and better. I still think there's a lot of um, open space there, for instance, in reasoning jointly about people. What does one person's attention tell me about the other person's attention? And reasoning about over time from videos and trying to understand deeply what's going on. And these systems also surface really interesting challenges in integration because they're composed of many different technologies. Uh, there's fascinating sort of integrative AI challenges like blame assignment. Something goes wrong somewhere at the end. How do I know where I should place blame in this entire system and so on? But to recap, in 2007, we were miserably failing this way. And these days, we're miserably failing this other way. So you could ask, what have we done, really? And uh, I'll leave you, I'll close with this thought um, that um, this, is a, this is a plot of word error rates, speech recognition word error rates over time. I think this one starts at 1988. I think I've seen one of these plots first shown by uh, Richard Stern at CMU. And he might have had an even earlier version. But what's interesting to me about this plot is if we squint from a distance at it, what you notice is that the word error rate is somewhere high up, and it gets lower and lower and lower. And then all of a sudden it gets high again, and then lower and lower and lower, and then all of a sudden it's high again and lower. The reason this happens is people switch the problem, right? So first we've been working on 1,000 discon like disconnected word recognition, and then we go to 5,000 words, and then we want to do red speech, and then natural speech, and then far distant microphones, and so on. And so what I feel has gone on with my work between the past work that I've done and since I've joined MSR is basically one of these shifts. And uh, I would like to thank Eric because I think he has been instrumental in this. And um, he's been, his support has been fabulous. I, I remember distinctly one of these conversations where you know, I was on this first line in 2007 after I joined. And I was still working on improving belief tracking in dialogue systems. And I was writing these papers. I was collaborating with the speech research guys. And we had some 1% improvement on, on some, you know, on some F metric or something like that. I don't know what it was. And I remember Eric saying, like, this is great. But look, why don't you, you know, like instead of 1% improvement on something, let's think big. Let's place a big bet. Let's do something that's really um, out there that, that you cannot really solve today. And I think his support has been tremendous through all of that. Um, and thank you for that, Eric, and happy birthday. So our next speaker, I think, will be uh, Edith Law. Um, okay. Uh, hi, everyone. So, a couple of months ago, I had a conversation with my PhD student, Alex Williams. Uh, I told him that I'm coming to Microsoft Research. Uh, he's actually interning right now, like many of us in the past. He has the privilege of interning at Microsoft Research this summer. Uh, and I said, you know, he, and he asked me why I'm coming. And I said, Eric is having his 60th birthday party. There's some mega celebration and conference event. To which he replied, ha ha, really? <laughs> I feel like he'll unveil that he's actually part machine since 1989. <laughs> it's a secret to not sleeping. And I said, oh my god, you got it. He's part. AI and part human. <laughs> that explains everything, right? It explains why he has so much energy, explains why as an intern I get emails from him at 3 a.m. in the morning talking about research. Um, and also explain, the human part explains his curiosity about just about anything and everything. Um, and maybe it also explains why in the past decade he has been a champion of human AI research. Um, so, when I was a graduate student uh, at CMU, I arrived there in 2006. Uh, I was really interested in human intelligence and machine intelligence, any type of intelligence. Um, I was set on doing machine learning research. Uh, and then my then advisor showed me the ESP game. He showed me reCAPTCHA, and I was hooked. You know, this new idea of human computation, how can we leverage human resources on the internet and 
accomplish tasks together with uh, supported by machines. Um, I um, did an internship at Microsoft Research uh, with Max Chigrin. And at that time, there was a lot of excitement about this new idea. Uh, and we spent a lot of time talking about, well, there's actually no research community whatsoever in human computation. Let's just create one. And this was back in 2009 uh, with Paul Bennett, who is here, uh, Max Chigrin, um, a bunch of people at NYU. We proposed to have a first workshop on human computation at the KDD conference in Paris. Um, and and of course, we organized many workshops after that. Um, there were about uh, four workshops after that. And at some point, I, I, uh, a bunch of us asked, approached Eric and said, really, we need a permanent home for this community. Um, and so we wrote a proposal with Eric to make this into uh, an official conference under the AAA umbrella. Uh, and this has become an annual conference that has gone on for six years now, and next year is gonna be the 10th year anniversary of the conference. Uh, and I wanted to say that this was really exciting, right? As, as a graduate student, as an intern, I had the opportunity to work on starting something like this. And this is, you know, this is one of the part of the amazing thing about Microsoft Research is that it gives interns this opportunity, these, these big, um, big things that they can actually accomplish. Um, uh, and the other thing is uh, that I think human competition was a very young area. Um, there was a lot of excitement about it, but there was also a lot of skepticism. And so I think without Eric's leadership, I think this whole thing wouldn't have happened. This community wouldn't have grown to the size that it is now. Um, so we really thank you for that. Um, so the other thing is I, 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 at some point in my PhD career, I realized that you know, he, the, the machine learning part really ought to be part of the human computation. And I really wanted to work with someone who is actually um, doing work at the intersection of the two fields. Um, and there are not many people like that. So I basically stalked Eric for a while. And uh, when he came to CMU to a party, I cornered him and I said, that I really want to work with you on projects. And so, we, um, at my internship, we worked on multiple projects, including looking at how do you do human computation with just one person? Like, so how do we actually make sure that we can route tasks to the best worker? Um, what if you have re web search relevance judgment? What happens if you can actually make them choose a query to judge instead of just give, forcing them to, to, to judge certain queries? Uh, we, with Hao Chi, we also worked on a secret project. I'll tell you why it's secret in, in a while. Uh, basically, we developed an interface where we wanted to, um, to use it to coordinate a plan um, that is generated by a massive number of people on the internet. So imagine a crowd of people that all, all of a sudden want to create like an event um, and they want to create a travel itinerary can coordinate thousands of people creating a single plan. Uh, we kept this a, a secret. Well, actually, we didn't quite keep it a secret. We told Eric that we were working on a secret project. Can we do it? Uh, and he said, fine. Um, and the reason is that we were planning to deploy Moby to thousands of Microsoft interns and have them plan their own intern event. Um, and at some point, we were like, well, the police are going to come after us because there will be thousands of people on the street. Uh, you know, apparently coordinate their own events. And I think how she even talked to a lawyer about this. Uh, at the end, we didn't do it, just because. <laughs> uh, but it was, it was really fun. Uh, and Eric has also been instrumental in my PhD work, which is about how to combine human and machine um, at a large scale to uh, learn attributes of objects like music and videos and images and so on. Um, so I want to say that one of the main, I think one of the main contribution that Eric brought, um, at least to my career, is that he created a safe space that where we can do research at the intersection of HCI and AI. Um, I think that one of the toughest challenge uh, for me as a PhD student at that time was that people always ask me, are you 
HCI researcher or an AI researcher. And you know, to which I think Eric gave us the liberty to, to basically answer like, why does it matter, right? The most exciting place to be is actually at the intersection. And so I'm now an assistant professor at uh, University of Waterloo, heading an XCI group. And virtually all the projects that I do has some element of XCI and AI in it. Uh, for example, we are working on projects looking at how to coordinate um, people to do these medical annotation tasks uh, that are very unfamiliar to people. Um, uh, like, like sleep stage classification or heart sound annotation. Uh, we're looking at also questions about interpretability, trust, how people interact with AI systems and robotic system. Uh, and one of my pet project right now is looking at um, teachable robots. How can we develop robot that kids can teach and learn through teaching while teaching? And how can we design these robots so that we can actually use it to enhance human curiosity? So um, I will just want to end with uh, kind of a story. I wasn't sure whether I, whether I wanted to tell this story or not because it's a little bit personal. Um, but uh, Eric actually came to University of Waterloo to, to give a distinguished lecture. Um, at that time, I think it's also around the time where it was announced that he was going to head the Microsoft Research AI group. Um, and we had breakfast together. Uh, and he told me that, oh, I have a really, really important phone call I have to take. I almost canceled this trip because it's so important. And I can't tell you what it is. You might know about it in a few days. But um, you know, can I use your, your, your office for, a, for a Skype or something like that? Um, but then during, during breakfast, we had this really deep conversation about life because my mother had just passed away. Um, so he shared a lot of kind of wise thoughts about life and how we should approach um, things and his own experiences. Um, and then he went off and took that phone call and gave a distinguished lecture. So this is kind of also what I want to end with is that Eric is like a machine because he can do like, all these crazy things uh, in his career and lead this big in AI initiative at Microsoft Research, but then on the other side, he also really care about people, and um, so he's also very human. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is my partner in crime during the internship, <laughs> Hao Chi Chang from Northwestern. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? OK, good. <laughs> so yeah, I just, I'll, I'll say a couple of things about my work on computational ecosystems. Um, but really, I'm going to take this opportunity um, to talk a little bit about how Eric turned me into an HCI researcher, which I'm sure he doesn't want to hear. Um, right? Um, but um, using this as a way to showcase kind of three lessons that I learned from Eric uh, in walking together, uh, in working together, but also in walking together. Right? A lot of times that a lot of what I learned from Eric actually come on these long, meandering walks. Um, where I don't really don't know where I am anymore halfway through. And then he's like, oh, okay, let's just keep walking. Okay. Um, so I'll get it to, to these lessons in just a second. Um, but before I jump into those lessons, I, I just want to you know, state for, for, for history's sake that I actually started as an AI researcher. Okay, so this is actually a picture that Eric took of me at AAAI. This is my first conference as a first year PhD student ever um, going to AAAI. And um, I was talking to all these amazing researchers who came up to the poster. Oh, thanks. I appreciate it. It was very big, I could say that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and it had all these people coming to me and talking about the poster, and it was really exciting. And then some guy comes along, this wasn't Eric, um, who, who started critiquing my work and talking about how, how am I going to make money off this? Like, how does this, you know, advance this and that? And I had no idea how to talk to this guy. And then in comes Eric, and Eric starts defending my poster. Right? He starts telling this person about my work, how it works, and, and why it has these broader implications. And I'm like, who is this guy? <laughs> like, I've never met Eric before then. Um, and then, you know, he takes a nice picture of me and sends it to me and my advisor the day after, and it's... You know, really nice, and that's how I started meeting Eric. And um, 
a couple years later, um, Eric really did turn me into an HCI researcher, okay? So I have the data to prove it. So in this uh, graph that I produced last night, um, what I'm showing you, right, on the horizontal axis is my PhD and my career trajectory. Right now, I'm a professor at Northwestern. Um, and what you see from this graph is that I used to do AI work, right? And then since working with Eric in that gray box in the middle, I've kind of shifted over to doing stuff in HCI. Um, so, you know, I, I have Eric to blame for that. Um, but actually, this is um, kind of a false representation of what's happened, even if, you know, you look at the problem as components, this is what it will look like. Um, actually, if you think about it more as an integrated whole, uh, much like how Edith is talking about, um, what Eric helped me do is to learn how to integrate um, AI and HCI as joint perspectives and thinking about problem solving more broadly um, using humans and machines, okay? Um, so in this way, um, one of the first lessons I wanted to share that I learned from Eric is really thinking about designing integrated systems. And this is a quote that Eric gave in an interview where he said, I'm pretty sure that the next leaps in AI will come from integrative systems um, rather than wedges, wedges being wedges of intelligence. Um, we need to focus on building a system where the whole um, is greater than the parts. And I think Dan gave some great examples of this um, for doing this even with AI systems of how to build integrative systems. Um, for my work, I've taken it more to mean how to build integrative human machine systems. Um, so I've been doing this work on computational ecosystems where we've been thinking a lot about designing socio-technical systems, but where we're designing the process by which people work, the ways we organize, and the intelligent systems that support it as a coherent whole. Okay, so we're actually not just thinking about designing component technologies or one way of people uh, doing something and changing that only, but thinking about compositions of processes and ways to integrate groups and crowds in problem solving, for example. Um, so using this approach, we've been able to solve some really exciting problems in the world um, to advance the kind of human values that I care about that if you take a human-based approach, it doesn't really scale, um, but if you take a machine-based approach, it, it falls short of really advancing um, the true human parts of the problems that we care about. So um, these two examples I have are about advancing community-based problem solving, where um, on the left I'm showing you some work on community-informed planning, um, where we did do more work on facilitating complex planning um, with thousands of people participating in a planning process, uh, for example, for planning uh, large academic conferences. Um, on the right, we've been doing some work on physical crowdsourcing, where we're thinking about having people conveniently going about their way, helping with other tasks in their local communities, in a way that brings people closer together, but also solves these local problems. And I'll get into some of the principles um, for that example a little later. Um, I've also been using this kind of computational ecosystems idea of building solutions to advance and scale um, the learning of complex skills. So we have all these great advances in AI, for example, through intelligent tutors, um, for people being able to learn with AI agents. Um, but for certain things, like for example, learning how to code uh, professional quality web pages, um, it's not something that we could solve with AI alone. Um, so what we've been doing is advancing something we call readily available learning experiences, or RAIL, where we're transforming professionally made artifacts on the web, so all the web pages and web applications that are out there, into an authentic learning resource. Okay? So we're using a combination of AI, but also of uh, humans uh, with scaffolds for scaffolding a learner, making sense of these examples, um, managing the process of investigating them, reflecting, and being able to construct deeper conceptual models um, on how to actually build uh, complex artifacts like this by learning from the artifacts themselves. Um, and on the right, I'm showing you a picture of my research group uh, at Northwestern. Uh, I run a program called Design, Technology, and Research, where I train a large number of students, uh, mostly undergrads, but my PhD students as well. Um, and I'm doing it to not only train students how to do research, um, but really learning how to lead research projects and complex work more generally. Um, so over the last four years, I've trained 70 students in independent research. Um, and with this model, this computational ecosystem we have, um, I'm able to train uh, 20 uh, to 20 plus students at a time uh, with a single faculty mentor and scale that kind of training using um, automated systems together um, with these organizational processes and structures that we have uh, for mentoring students. So moving on to my second lesson, um, I wanna share this perspective um, of thinking about using AI to empower human interactions, right? So I got this quote from Eric's Mixed Initiative paper from 99, and it talks about this idea that the AI could be a way to enable new kinds of human-machine interaction. And it's a perspective that, you know, is kind of taken up in HCI, but, but I think actually not as fully as it could be um, in thinking about how AI could enable human interaction. So let me just give you some examples here um, where I've thought a lot about how to empower flexible and opportunistic ways of solving problems uh, within communities. So for example, on the left, um, for community-based planning, what I'm showing you is an interface that allows a decision maker, like a conference organizer, for example, um, to be able to use community input 
machine intelligence and their own tacit knowledge um, to make decisions about how to form a better plan. And what's interesting about that example is not so much using the machine just to resolve conflicts, but it's that the organizer can go into this and flexibly think about what they care about, but with an awareness of how it would affect the things that the machine knows about. Right? So you could actually apply a lot of tacit knowledge and actually do the things you want to do, um, but have the machine in the back supporting you being able to have that flexibility to not mess up the rest of the program. Um, and on the right, um, I'm showing you this example from uh, called Decision Theoretic Hit or Wait. So I've been doing this work in physical crowdsourcing, and what Decision Theoretic Hit or Wait does is it gives you this away for people to just do whatever it is that they feel like doing. They're just walking around. Um, you ping them and ask them, hey, can you help look for a lost item? It's, you're just passing right by an area where the item might be lost. And what it's doing in the back end, it's coordinating indirectly uh, these interactions so that people helping in the moments they feel like helping, as they wish, um, actually produces globally effective behaviors. Okay, so you could actually get uh, to 80 to 90% of the opt, uh, even if you actually knew uh, what people's routes were gonna be ahead of time, but you don't, right? So you're using decision theory in the back end to empower this kind of flexible and opportunistic way of solving problems, and where decision theory is not used just for optimization, but it's a way to enable new interactions. Okay, so on to my third and last lesson. Um, and this one just says, be bold and be you. So I've been traveling a bit, um, giving talks at different schools, and one of the things I realized and I was really grateful for as I was reflecting is how I just been able to, to do what I want to do um, and to solve the kind of problems that I want to solve. And I think, um, much like Edith was saying, I think Eric gave us a lot of confidence um, in being able to approach the problems we care about, um, not worrying too much about whether we could solve it today with just the technologies um, that we had on hand. Um, so I wanted to end um, on this picture where, um, you know, for me, one of the big challenges often is there's these values that we care about in the world that we think about as being very human. Um, and then the technological solutions almost never directly line up with the problems that we care about and the ones we want to solve. And the question, of course, is well, what do you do when this happens, right? So you could just go ahead and solve whatever problems the technology allows you to solve. Um, but I think we would all miss something if we don't stick with our values and what it is that we care about. And I think this is one of the things that I really learned from Eric is just to be bold and to do what it is that I want to do, um, even if a technological solution doesn't present itself. Okay. And the way to move forward, or one of the ways to move forward, um, are these lessons that I just shared. That these are three lessons I learned from Eric, but the title of this slide could just as well be how to build comprehensive solutions to complex real world problems. Right? And the three lessons are to design integrative systems, thinking about humans and machines working together um, within these computational ecosystems, um, and then using AI to empower new human interactions, and then being bold and just sticking with what it is that, that you wanted to do uh, all along. Okay. So thank you, and that's all I have. Um, so next up, we have a dish um, who's going to talk about his work. So hello everyone, uh, I'm Adish Singla, a faculty member at Max Planck Institute for Software Systems in Germany. I'm really glad to, hear, uh, to be here uh, to celebrate this uh, milestone birthday of Eric, and in this talk I would share some research directions towards teaching uh, and educating uh, people as well as assisting them in their tasks. So uh, let me begin by sharing uh, some of the collaborative collaborations and work that I have done with uh, Eric uh, as well as other colleagues at Microsoft Research. To begin with, uh, I did an internship at Microsoft uh, Research Redmond in fall 2013. So here I was working with Eric Hovitz and uh, Ryan White uh, where we were tackling problems in a multi-user search setting where there are multiple users behind a machine which leads to interleaved uh, search histories. And here we develop new techniques, uh, how to attribute search activity to individual users uh, so that we can improve personalization. We continued some of this collaboration uh, through our work on stochastic privacy where we introduced a new approach to privacy uh, using probabilistic methods. And then I did another internship uh, at Microsoft Cambridge this time, uh, but this was also co-supervised by Eric uh, remotely. And here we developed new pri privacy aware techniques to information gathering in social networks uh, and applied it to techniques for decentralized task routing. And that's a picture uh, from my uh, thesis defense in ETH Zurich uh, last year. And Eric's mentorship has played an important role in shaping the research direction that I'm pursuing at the moment. 
So right now, I'm uh, leading a machine teaching group at Max Planck Institute for Software Systems, and the focus of the group is towards uh, developing novel AI and machine learning techniques to empower people by uh, uh, teaching and assisting them. So in the context of uh, teaching people, so the current research is grounded in two concrete applications. So the first being a citizen science project for biodiversity monitoring, where we would like to teach people how to identify different animal and bird species. And uh, the second motivating application is uh, from educational simulators. Uh, so for instance, simulators for uh, surgical training or car driving are becoming increasingly, increasingly popular to provide cost-effective training. And uh, so here, uh, basically, the goal of our research is how to come up with teaching policies that could provide personalized curriculum uh, to make this teaching process more effective. And in the context of assisting people, the ongoing research is motivated by applications of assistive AI agents. Uh, so that could work in partnership with people to solve complex open-ended tasks. So one concrete scenario could, you could think about uh, car driving, where we would like to design an assistive AI agent that could drive the car in an autopilot mode, however, provide the control back to human driver uh, in safety critical situations. And uh, to tackle these kind of problems, we are essentially thinking about this human AI system as a multi-agent reinforcement learning system where we would like to learn a policy that optimizes joint performance uh, of the whole system. So in this talk, I would like to give you some research overview of what we have been doing in the context of uh, teaching, research theme of teaching. So uh, let me quickly uh, tell you what does it actually mean to teach a bit more formally. So it's basically an interaction between a teacher and learner, two players. And so it's somewhat of an inverse problem setting compared to a learning setting. And essentially, the focus here is on developing algorithms for a teacher, which is shown on the left here. And you could think about that teacher has some target in the mind, so theta star, which could represent an optimal policy that teacher would provide to uh, uh, train the learner. And the objective here is to come up with an optimal sequence of uh, training data to steer the learner towards this target. Right? And the interaction between teacher and learner could be thought of as follows. So let's say at some point, teacher gets to see a noisy estimate of what is the current state of the learner's mind. And based on that, it would provide uh, next training data uh, to some of, uh, so that learner can make some progress. So what is important to note here is that in our motivating applications, so there is no way for teacher to directly engineer this target theta star into mind of the learner. So uh, basically, this transfer of knowledge has to happen through this limited communication uh, that we have. And the communication here basically means a labeled, labeled image, for example, or some kind of demonstration of how to perform an action in a particular state. Uh, so I typically like to think about the research problems in this uh, space of teaching uh, along these different dimensions. And uh, first important dimension is to think about what exactly is the task that we are interested in teaching. And we could have tasks of increasing complexity. For instance, uh, teaching a task of how to do binary labeling to multi-class labeling or teaching sequential policies of how to act in an environment. And the second crucial aspect is basically how do we go about modeling uh, the learner's uh, proce learning process. And here one simple solution is we could think about some classical machine learning model which is suitable for the task. Uh, while it's normally typically easier to design teaching policies for such machine learning models, they might perform very badly when we would apply them on human learners. And uh, the next step could be one could tweak these machine learning models to make them a little more human-like, which are more robust uh, and suitable for human learners. And a more practical solution would be to consider some cognitive models of human learning process uh, so that they can actually uh, reflect how human uh, human uh, learning in the system. What is important to note here is that as we in increase the complexity of this learner's model, it gets a lot more challenging to come up with optimal teaching policies and or to provide some kind of performance guarantees. And the third crucial uh, dimension of this space is uh, how much t knowledge teacher has about the learner, right? So one simple setting is where we could think about a teacher being very powerful, an omniscient teacher who knows everything about the learner. Uh, a somewhat more realistic setting could be uh, where learner doesn't know the current state of, uh, state of mind of the learner or has some noisy estimate of it. A little bit more challenging setting would be uh, that would reflect realistic scenarios is where there's some kind of model mismatch between learner and student. For instance, in educational simulators, we could uh, think about uh, that there's a mismatch of state space or feature representation or the perceived rewards between teacher and student are different. 
So what is important to note here in this space is that as we go from left to right, the complexity of the problem increases. Uh, while the, we are able to capture more realistic and real world richer applications, it gets a lot more challenging to come up with um, teaching policies uh, that we could actually uh, uh, optimize. So next I would like to give you a quick snapshot of uh, what we have been doing recently in our group uh, and try to highlight where they fit in this problem space. So first is a recent project on um, where we have been trying to uh, work towards teaching a multi-class labeling task. And one of the motivating application here is what I mentioned earlier about uh, biodiversity monitoring, where we would like to teach people uh, to identify different uh, animal and bird species. Another motivating application here is uh, to teach vocabulary of a new language, for instance, via showing flashcards. So uh, more concretely, let's say you have four different flashcards, uh, four vocabulary words, and let's say you could interact with the learner for 20 different time steps. So then the research question here would be, what is an optimal schedule to show these different flashcards so that we could maximize the long-term recall probabilities of the learner? So what is important in this uh, project is how do we kind of think about the limited memory uh, effect of the uh, behavior of the learner? So since human learners have limited uh, memory, so it's very important to kind of uh, model the forgetful behavior of these learners. And for this work, what we use is uh, cognitive models of human learning, which have basically this effect of limited memory. So for this work, what we have designed algorithms which basically uh, output produce optimal teaching schedules with some near, uh, near optimal teaching schedules with some provable guarantees for these kind of memory models. And we have developed two teaching platforms in this uh, work. One is to teach name of the species, and the other is to teach German vocabulary, which are uh, accessible online. So another recent project is about uh, teaching sequential policies motivated by this application of a car driving simulator. So here, uh, what basically we are trying to think about the problem is teacher could provide demonstrations to the learner of how to perform different actions in a particular state. And the goal here is to uh, somehow teach this policy shown in the blue by providing some kind of uh, demonstrations. So, uh, so here we consider basically this car driving scenario. We model this whole environment uh, using this simple simulated environment. Uh, and then we have basically this optimal algorithms of how we can uh, produce this optimal sequence of demonstrations. So what you can see below is uh, one thing I would like to highlight is here we are considering more complex teaching tasks. So here we are actually talking about uh, teaching sequential policies of how to perform actions. Uh, while on the other hand, uh, we are essentially considering a simpler learner model. So here the learner model is a simple classical inverse reinforcement learning algorithm to keep the problem tractable as a first starting point. So that's a quick snapshot of uh, what uh, I've been doing in my group recently, and I would be happy to share these research directions in more detail. Uh, to summarize, I would really like to thank Eric and colleagues at Microsoft Research for their mentorship, and I'm looking forward to continue our collaborations in the future. And thank you, everyone, for listening. So our next speaker is Michael Bunston from Stanford. All right. So I started by thinking, how should I describe Eric? And then I realized, I have data on this. 10 years ago, I worked with Eric and Desney Tan and Mary Cherwinski to try and figure out information that wasn't out on the web writ large. We created this Facebook game where basically people would all start tagging each other. It was sort of like a game of family feud to try and guess what people had said about each other. So I went back and um, Eric, this is your life, um, <laughs> at least as of 2008. So there's a bunch of stuff that I think makes sense there. Others I'm, I'm really curious about. Like, yeah, I was wondering if you, did you ram a boat or something like this? That, like, th this unigram model doesn't, isn't quite working for me. But I think it really carries a lot to say about how Eric has integrated a lot of different perspectives together. And you see different sub-communities of, of him uh, saying, you know, overlapping and somewhat different things about him. And I think that, and as how she mentioned, the mixed initiative paper really captures a lot of how I, the, the energy and the drive that I take from having worked with Eric now twice, um, just understanding how we can go after really ambitious goals. Like, how would we as humanity go about creating the next, oh, the next world wonder, right? 
let's not try to build software. Let's create something truly imaginative. And what I take from Eric is just this really deep understanding of how we should be thinking about this combination of human intelligence and artificial intelligence, because we know that human intelligence isn't very good at this. In fact, there's an entire field called organizational behavior that says how terrible we really are at it. Um, and it's just like we have biases and heuristics that we use for individual cognition that don't quite work. So too are we really bad at thinking about how we should design aggregate human endeavors. But as Eric would say, for the first time, we have all of this happening inside of a computer, right? And because of that, we have an opportunity to actually design it. Just like I would design an individual's interaction with a computer, we can design aggregate interactions to think about how computational intelligence might augment us in creating that, that next world wonder. And I think you know, my, my work and how I've taken f this from Eric has really spanned all the way from the individual level out to the organization, to the world. And I just want to give a sense of like how that really has percolated through my thinking. Um, you know, to start, this kind of individual work that you see basically underpinning all modern AI systems, here trying to label uh, a man riding a motorcycle, yes or no, um, is really sort of boring, <laughs> not that interesting, and not taking a lot of advantage of the human cognitive capacity. But what we, what we can start to do is do this in a bit more fun way. Uh, audience participation, everyone please hold up your hands. And what I'd like you to do is clap whenever you see a man riding a, a motorcycle. It's gonna be a little hard. Here we go. Ready, set, go. Oh, come on, you can do better than that. Okay, so you might notice that you're not so good at this, but in aggregate, there's actually some signal here. You're delayed, there's some error, but we can understand that by the, take advantage of what the human perceptual processor is good at and what computer processors are good at, like dealing with this noise and this error, and produce something that actually produces really high quality labels at an order of magnitude, lower cost or higher speed, whatever you, you care about. And I think you drive this forward and there are so many opportunities for this integrated uh, uh, opportunity. So we do so much work here in organizations, in teams, my research happens in teams, product development happens in teams, and we can think of this question like, well, how, what's the optimal way to even work together? How should we be doing this? Should we be flat, hierarchical? Should we be really supportive of each other? Should we be really mean to each other just to get the facts out? Should we make sure that everyone's speaking equally or not? And you know, we, we, we come up with these theories about what's optimal, and then we create these systems that try to encourage people to, to, and nudge them toward these structures. And again, the behavioral sciences actually say, this is probably a terrible idea, that there's no optimal way to organize a team. Uh, this th thing is called structural contingency theory. It says that it depends on the people and the task. Um, and worse, if we pick the wrong ones, the team really, really stinks, and they're mad, and they're upset, and they fracture. Moreover, managers who've paid a lot of money to learn how to do this, and are then paid a lot of money to do this, are actually pretty bad at it. So we start to think about how can computational intelligence help this? Could a team sort of experiment on itself and rapidly identify the right set of structures? You know, you have a team's coming in, use the system, and get colored differently based on the people and the kind of thing they're trying to do. Could we do this fast enough that it would be valuable? You have hundreds of different combinations, but roughly what you're imagining is you start out with nothing, you give feedback to the system, either autom automated, if we can measure how it's going, or subjective, and then the system makes a, a suggestion like, hey, I know this sounds a little silly, but let's all try to be extra cheery right now. Or why don't we try a decentralized hierarchy? And through rounds of feedback, the system quickly tries to identify what's the right set of structures for that team. It's this integration of the human reflection and the artificial intelligence. Of course, behind this is a network of bandits. Um, I should be talking to Mosin more, my colleague, since he's clearly doing this better than I am. Um, but one thing that we found is that if you just use a straight up uh, network of bandits, people ignore it. It's like basically if I, as an advisor, tell my students to do 15 things at once, they listen to none of them. I mean, maybe they would do that anyway. But uh, the, especially if I say too many things. So we started developing new, new models of bandits that are temporally constrained, trying to smooth over how much change can happen at once. Uh, so we can model how, many, how much change can a team absorb at once, trying to change the sort of posteriors in the, in the Tomplin, Thompson sampling algorithm to say, well, maybe we only want a quarter as much change as you might naturally want to do, and try to keep everything a bit smoother. And we can do this across the entire network of bandits, and it has some incredible opportunities to allow us to say, all right, no more, for example, than say two changes at a time, or certain dimensions 
Uh, we know, for example, hierarchy should not be changed at the beginning, but can be changed at the end. And it turns out when we try this, we, have we bring together these teams, we have them play really hard, uh, uh, solve hard puzzles, and we can have managers try to decide what to do. We give them the exact same set of structures. We can let, uh, we can let the group decide collectively. We can just let things roll as they will. We can use a, a straight up network of bandits, or we can use these temporally constrained bandits. And what we find is that these teams that are using the temporal constraints are performing about 40% better way better than, I'm, I'm sorry, are, are there any managers in the room? I should probably not be showing this. Um, all of the other teams were statistically indistinguishable from each other. This integration of the artificial intelligence and the human intelligence produced something way better than the people who were risk averse and not trying enough things or the algorithms that were trying to do too many things at once. But could we scale this up even further? Could we create you know, on-demand flash organizations, these groups that could rapidly assemble and adapt? You know, imagine how your organization works today, but essentially driven and aided by computation to help its adaptation. Imagine an organization that could adapt much, much faster. Right? Imagine the, these roles, teams, hierarchy of your organization being sort of source code of your organization. And if a machine could introspect on that, it could do things like identify an opportunity for a role that needs to be hired, and a few minutes later have exactly the world's expert for what you need. Or to help onboard that individual, tell them about their position in the organization and how they should be, how, how they should be interacting with the people around them. You could allow people bottom up or top down to suggest changes to the organizational structures, issue pull requests and merge those in so that the organization can change as it, gain, as it gains new information. And if we do this, we see some crazy things. Uh, crowds that can then do product design, software development, game production um, in about six weeks. Imagine again having something that you, that you, that you, a role that you realize you need and then 15 minutes later having the world's expert at your fingertips helping you solve the problem. So we have these things, uh, we, we, we gave this to people who had no prior experience, they're building uh, tablet applications, web applications, they're creating marketing teams that make videos. Uh, there are teams of poets and a chief poetry officer, which I've never seen before, and so on. So what I really see here is that there's just this opportunity, and I think how Chi alluded to this and Edith alluded to this, that by thinking about that integration effectively, we can get much further. So I'll close with an embarrassing story. I'm embarrassed to say it's not actually embarrassing to Eric, it's mostly embarrassing to me, because I went back trying to figure out how did Eric and I first start interacting? And I was expecting it was right around the time that I started uh, interning with him and Disney and Mary. And it turned out, unfortunately, I really should not be keeping my email records this far back. Um, in 2006, um, an email started like this. Dear Dr. Horvitz, I am an undergraduate at Stanford writing an honors thesis. And my first response was, no. Because as a professor, I get a lot of emails that start just like that. And it goes on to say, I found your work, predicting user activities, extremely useful. It was one of the first that I read when I was beginning my project. Again, I've gotten a lot of these emails, and I'm, and I'm thinking, no, don't do it, Michael. Then I say, I'm now at the point of having pilot software and a coherent theory. I've written a white paper, and I've made it public. No, please. And I don't even know what I meant by coherent theory, by the way. Um, and then I do it. I basically say, hey, person, you know, famous researcher, I'm an undergraduate, please read my paper. And so I didn't feel very good about this, um, but Eric actually responded, which is, I think, a statement to sort of the care that he provides to people. Um, the one thing I'll call out about his response is that he apologizes for it being delayed. Um, it was one day later. <laughs> Um, so, Eric, I think you just work on a different time scale than everyone else. That's truly incredible. So thank you for keeping us all engaged and getting us started even before we even knew we were getting started in this area. And I will stop there. It really has been a fun time. Uh, thanks to Eric, to Sue, to, to Mary, to Desney, to Jamie, and everyone who has uh, really guided my, my path here. Thanks.